to infinity and beyond. This is me. This is how I win. Were you rushing or were you dragging? Answer! You're a wizard, Harry. Say what again? Say what again? I dare you. No. I am the father. Hasta la vista, baby. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Hello, everyone. Welcome back inside the film room. Zach Goins here with Johnny Sobchak for what's going to be a great episode breaking down King Richard, an Oscars frontrunner with a particular Oscar frontrunner at the helm. But uh, Johnny, what's going on? How are you today? I am doing fine, Zach. It is a Monday. We've both been Love busy it. working. So, you know, can't complain. Can't complain. Could be worse cannot complain at all it's better than not working but here we are to end our monday in fabulous fashion with another episode of inside the film room so we can give the people what they want on a tuesday morning as they tune in but gotcha. uh of course it is a monday podcast like you said because we will be talking succession season three episode six once we get back off the uh, succession train maybe we can get back to being a monday podcast but for now we are a tuesday podcast and other than that, we're doing news, like always, a light week in news. And then, like I said, a King Richard review. So it should be a good, fairly quick episode, probably, but uh, it'll be good nonetheless. But off the top, just like last week, I want to hit the people with a reminder to go and subscribe to The Rewind, our new newsletter, the new newsletter. We are hitting your inbox with valuable inside the film room information with new podcast episodes, new reviews, newsletter exclusive information and breakdowns. Johnny's doing some Oscar talk. You've got a lovely introduction from me each week. This will be the second week that it's going out. So I'm living up to the weekly promise there. Nothing more, nothing less. I promise, like I said last week, we will not spam your inbox, but please go subscribe to that. That's going to help us take this thing to the next level. It's going to help us get access to some bigger things and, uh, Really, just the more that you follow that, we will be able to give you more based on what that will get us. So follow the Rewind, subscribe to it so you can get our newsletter. You can find that on the website. We've got pop-ups, we've got sidebars, and we've got an official post on the news tab to go and subscribe. So please do that. And while you do that, you will find out about our latest giveaway. It's still running from last week. We've got two Ted Lasso items up for grabs. All you have to do to be entered to win is subscribe to the Rewind. It is a Ted Lasso AFC Richmond jersey with Lasso on the back, number one jersey. And then we've also got an AFC Richmond scarf up for grabs. It's red and blue. It'll keep you warm this holiday season. And those winners will be announced on December 1st and 2nd. So next Wednesday and Thursday as we kick off the holiday season of giving at Inside the Film Room. We've got a ton of exciting stuff lined up to give away and it'll all start with you subscribing to The Rewind. So be sure to you to subscribe there so you don't miss out on any of those opportunities. But beyond that, Johnny, how was your weekend? What have you been up to? What have you been watching other than your fabulous girlfriend performing and just wowing people enough to sign autographs in the crowd? Yeah, I mean, that was really the highlight. I mean, <clears throat> it's hard to beat that with a, an episode of television or a movie or something, right? Yeah, yeah, it's no no contest for sure. Um, and you're, I mean, you're familiar enough with live performance, you you get it. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I was able to squeeze in a, a decent amount. Uh, you know, primarily King Richard, uh, I got to check that out new release from Warner Brothers, their second to last release of the year. And this is their big kind of typical biopic drama, like prestige, um, you know, Oscar player this year, um, right up there 
you know, going to be contending for best picture, pretty much locked up for best actor. And I was looking forward to, I, I'm not crazy about sports movies, generally speaking. It's not a subgenre that I'm especially fond of, uh, which is interesting because I mean, I grew up really into sports and I played sports my entire life and, but it never was really like really enraptured by any particular sports movie. Like I know some people are with things like, um, I can't even think it like, I don't know, Friday night lights. Like, or remember like, the Titans or something. Remember the Titans or we are Marshall, like all these other things. Um, and Rocky. And I, I didn't really grow up with any of those, like is it really at the forefront of my little movie goer brain. So, um, but this is not, you know, a typical sports movie, I would say it is definitely more of like a character study, like actors showcase the entire cast is excellent. Not just Will Smith, Anjanou Ellis, and, um, uh, Sania, Sydney, she, they're, they're just really, really great. And John Bernthal, of course, has a little mm-hmm. turn. He's, he's kind of almost like against type, like he plays like a nice, like likable guy and he's in it he's not like a gruff grizzled cop or something he's not in it for like one scene he's actually in it like a good amount like almost a half hour's worth of screen time so uh yeah i was really i was very pleased with this one it was as crowd pleasing as you you know as as it had been billed and i think it'll be uh worthy of you know whatever adoration it gets this season i hope people check it out i know at the box office it didn't do too well Hopefully Thanksgiving uh, and and families being together and going out to the movies, maybe we'll give it an extra boost. And then of course, HBO Max numbers will hopefully be decent as well. So, uh, but then outside of that, also Succession was the main attraction. As I told you earlier, Tick, Tick, Boom. I've been looking forward to it. I like Andrew Garfield a lot. And uh, there's something about this particular musical I think is arriving at a relevant time for myself. So I'm looking forward to watching that when I can. I'm waiting for my girlfriend who as you mentioned, is a musical theater, um, you know, kind of nerd. So I think she'll like that one. And we'll probably watch that in the next few days. Maybe I can mention it next week. Well, you've been, you, you were still able to, like you said, squeeze in quite a bit, uh, even with your busy schedule. But I uh, was able to see King Richard a, a little bit ago at Film Fest 919. I saw it opening night at the drive-in theater over there. And same, similar mm-hmm. feelings as you that uh, it was, it was fantastic. Will Smith, incredible. But we will be getting into that later. Hopefully, like you said, uh, some Thanksgiving a crowd will trickle in. They'll at least throw it on on HBO Max to to check it out after they've had some turkey. But other than King Richard, I was able to, first off, crack open a Criterion collection that I picked up on the recent sale. I watched Memories of Murder for the first time. A little director bong, uh, a bong hit there. But bong it hit. was... I, I will say you you said this was an L in our group message. Um, I, like I still I really enjoyed it. Like it was, I think four out of five stars for me is what I gave it on Letterboxd. But hmm. I still it was probably my least. I've seen four Bong movies now. Um, so Parasite, Snowpiercer, Okja, and Memories of Murder, and that is the order that I have ranked them in right there. Um, okay. So I know you were you said it was an L. That was my least uh, lowest ranked bong movie but again it was the the least of like all fantastic so i uh hope you don't judge me too hard on that but i also got to check out two screeners after signing away my first child and you know uh giving them every thumbprint every toe print over to disney and you know signing (laughs) multiple contracts that i was able to check out the first two episodes of hawkeye which come out by the time you're listening to this our review will be up on the website. The embargo lifts Tuesday at noon Eastern time. So go check that out on the website if you want full thoughts, because I can't give them to you now because technically this podcast will release before that embargo, but go check out the written review. So social reaction is already out there. You can find that on my Twitter as well. It was fun. I can't give away too much more than that, but those episodes at the time I watched them, they were five days away from coming out. And it was the most insane screener process I've ever seen. Disney has a new platform that they're moving away from. For, it's like an internal Disney platform versus uh, they used to use like digital screeners, which a couple different studios use. But it was like you had to sign, like create an account, have two-factor authentication, sign a DocuSign waiver, um, and then watch it with a screen, like with like, your email address across the entire screen for the whole time and it didn't fade at all so 
God. I may have to rewatch some stuff so I can actually <laughs> see it, but uh, those episodes will be out uh, on Wednesday and you'll be able to check them out. So that was my, my viewing weekend, my viewing week. So Hawkeye and Memories of Murder. But uh, other than that, it was a good time. A succession, of course, as well, which we can dive into here in a second. But are you planning to, I know we've kind of gone back and forth on the MCU this year. Are you planning to at least check out the first two episodes of Hawkeye as they do that double premiere? Oh, God. Um, it's not like a top priority. It's not know, right when it drops. You're not waking up and watching it. Oh, like we Like we started not. the year it, with WandaVision. It's, when, when is it dropping? It's Wednesday. I would imagine it's like the the midnight Pacific. That, that's what they used to do or have been doing so far, I believe. Yeah, that's not, I'm not going to be up uh, to watch that. That's for sure. Um, which is crazy because the beginning of the year, WandaVision had my ass up at 3 a.m., you know, trying to keep up with what was going on. Um, but uh, I don't yeah, know how far no, we've come. Yeah, between, between you know, it's going to be a busy, busy end of the week here, I think, between Thanksgiving and my birthday and, and some other things. So we'll see, you know, when and if I get around to it, maybe it's when I'll just wait for a few episodes to come out and then I'll, you know, watch that kind of binge the first half and then maybe we'll wait and see where the rest of it goes, what people say about it. But I will say it's only six episodes. So they're giving you a third of it up front with this double premiere. <laughs> um, so it'll be, uh, I mean, it's got a lot going for it. And the fact that like, it's, you know, it's got the holiday theme, so it, it it has like any as our friend of the pod Josh Martin is like a huge like diehard Christmas fan like he'll just like go for anything with the like Christmas gimmick so that someone that's not typically like crazy about Marvel he's I know he's more excited about this because of the Christmas element and also it's like set in New York City so it has the New York element it's a superhero who's not really a superhero you know he's the most grounded of any Avenger so it has the potential to kind of have a a different feel than uh what the mcu has provided us with for the most part so it'll be interesting to see how how much of those like that expectation actually turns into reality yeah that's i think that's one thing that i'm almost maybe a little bit that makes me a little bit more interested is it doesn't seem like it's gonna be super connected or like have any super big you know consequences necessarily for like things like loki or, or wandavision the things we've been kind of right I, I think the biggest the biggest connection or anything that we should be anticipating is like the florence Pugh appearance after the ending of black widow but i mean that's exactly. not some like earth shattering like nexus event or anything <laughs> exactly so well shall we switch over from uh, a little hawkeye talk into our weekly succession discussion let's do it S- episode six we have crossed the halfway point and you know what started out as a, a great look for Kendall coming in hot this season has he's been sl- sliding downhill though don't you think he is just a horrible mess of a human being <laughs> um it's it's a very difficult to get a read on what this guy is who he is what he is trying to achieve um I really, it's really like scene to scene. It's like, you have no idea what the hell to make of it. It's just like everything he says, I, like it, it's so hard to root. Like we used to kind of, he's always been positioned as the protagonist and it's kind of been like, okay, even though we know he's bad, we're like rooting for him still just cause that's like the, he's the protagonist. But like every time he opens his mouth now, it's just like, it's, oh my gosh, this guy, like, what is he doing? Like this lawyer that he fought for at the very beginning of the year, he's now getting rid of Lisa. I don't know if he like officially fired her, but he says he now has new lawyers. So like who was supposedly the best of the best, like they didn't tell him what he wanted. And so he just got rid of them. And now it's a whole new, we don't, we don't know who the new lawyers are, but he's advertising that they're going to do what he wants and try harder and work harder. And that he's just continuously spiraling. It's, it's impossible to keep up with his next move. Right. And, you know, <clears throat> that's the thing is like, you're watching him seemingly, it's like he's constantly, and this is something I think, I think was it, I can't remember which character said this. It might've been Shiv, might've been Roman, maybe it was both of them. But they say that he always, they're not worried about him really because he always manages to self-destruct. 
they don't even need to do anything. They just have to out, you know, kind of wait him out. And that's really what is kind of happening, at least at this point, from what we can tell. I mean, he is just making the wrong choices. He he had this, I guess, <clears throat> a questioning, you know, kind of session with, I guess this was the DOJ or some representatives from the DOJ. And it doesn't, it's not really clear what this meeting was all about or what kind of questions. It was basically to see us where his head was at. And of course, he's still trying to get immunity and things like that. But mm-hmm. he, they show him prepping to go and do this earlier in the episode. And you're like, okay, this is what you've been working for. Like this is, you know, it's, it's kind of, you, you have a great lawyer, you have a great team, you're rehearsing, you're kind of figuring out his lawyer's telling him it'll be fine. It's just, he's just a little bit nervous. And then they come out of the, uh, out of the, they show you like the last question they ask and he gives like the worst possible answer. Well, also before <laughs> that, like in the, in the prep <laughs> session that you're referencing, it's like, this guy has, like I just said, that the best of the best lawyer and who's trying their best to prepare him. And he's like, not even cooperating. Like it's this cockiness, this like arrogance yeah. that he has where he's not even like cooperating with the question, like in the practice session that you talked about, like they ask him a question and instead of answering it like truthfully, he just like makes fun of them and like gives a fake confession or something. And like, as if he's like, I'm going to go in here, it's going to be a cakewalk, whatever. And then like you were just now saying, like we cut to the very end of his actual interview and he's just unable to come up with a good response and like stumbling his way out of this interview. And then we hear them discuss like, Oh, that did not go the way we planned. Exactly. And just what like uh i mean i don't know where this is going i think i've said this before but like that's the greatest thing about this show is it's impossible to to really figure out what the hell is going to happen to these characters and and not even just long term but like from episode to episode it's like what could happen now and i just that's kind of the point i'm at like it's almost like a climax with kendall at this point where it's like where can the guy go but down and not, but also he's been so down in the past. He's been, uh, you know, relapsed and he's killed people on accident and he has uh, betrayed him, him, his best friend. And he's been his dad's Aki, even though he hated him. Uh, you know, if he falls from here, like, where does he go? Like, where does it stop? You know what I mean? And that's not really clear. We do get some glimpses at next episode and that seems like it's going to have huge ramifications. Um, and I'm very excited. I think next week's episode could be like very, very good and, and could uh, have some, some huge ripple effects. But uh, yeah, at this point, it's just, and I will say it, to his credit, the scene where he comes in and makes a play on Tom at the end, I thought was great. And actually he played it very smart and it was interesting to see the kind of angle he was taking with Tom. Uh, I'm not sure what you thought about that, but I, it was kind of nice to see him rebound in some form or fashion from what went on earlier in the episode to kind of make a little right. sneaky, sneaky power play with that phone call and then meeting him at the diner. It's interesting to see how Tom has kind of like, Tom's situation has not gotten better. It has probably gotten worse since they last spoke. But like, so it's interesting to see Tom like put up this front as, he basically last time they were together was when Kendall was like, there's a better life for you, brother, or whatever he whispered in his ear. And like, yeah. it was like Tom is jumping ship next episode. That was like the vibe that he gave off. And if anything, he's like gotten stronger and more committed to Shiv and Logan for some reason, even though he's like going down with the ship, researching prisons and learning about all the uses of the toilet and all of that. But it, <laughs> the, the diner scene was funny because it, that we went there twice once with Greg and Tom in the middle of the night. And then once with, with Kendall and Tom, but it gave me, it was the succession version of the special episode of euphoria with Coleman Domingo and Zendaya in their, in their diner booth as they're contemplating life. But that takes me to our next bullet point, which was another, like, I think Matthew McFadden, the actor who plays Tom is like delivering. He's like, single-handedly delivering the best performances on the show like not I mean obviously we've talked about like Jeremy Strong and Kendall like actual like performance performance but like Tom has had like the best lines the best arc the best everything so far on this season like watching him just like 
spiral in a very different way. It's like a, a pity, yeah. self pity spiral versus like a self destructive <laughs> spiral. Yeah, I agree. Matthew McFadden, he is uh, crushing, and this is maybe the biggest episode he's crushed yet because he has a lot going on between. And really in these one-on-one scenes, whether it's with him and Shiv, which was maybe their biggest scene of the entire, you know, season so far. Uh, then the scene with him and Greg at the diner, which again, might be the biggest of the season. Of course, there's the the one, I think, from what, episode three, where he was talking about, um, uh, you know, cutting his balls off and making him into his wife, uh, which was great. But then also, as we mentioned, the scene with, with, uh, Kendall now where he's Kendall knows what's up like he is not he, he Kendall's really the only one who sees where Tom is and what Tom is at this point um there's no like doubting it. And Greg you know maybe he does but he doesn't really care as much like he's really just looking out for himself and um, Greg was able to pass off his convictions on a Tom it sounds like I don't know if that's like there was never a done deal or anything in writing. So we'll see if that actually ends up happening. But Tom was just, yeah, sure. Pile it on. (laughs) No big deal. And then Shiv is maybe, I don't know, I don't know, delusional about her relationship with Tom and where Tom is at mentally. Um, So, but Kendall has no, you know, he, he has no misconceptions or anything. He sees where Tom is at with Shiv. He sees where Tom is at within the family and within the company and how he's being truly, you know, offered up um, and he's going down. So it, honestly, I like where, I like the deal Kendall is offering. Like, I think that that would be very interesting. And I think that would be, I mean, when they went back, I'm so damn curious to see what happens because as much as Shiv and Kendall hate each other and do not get along, you know, if it, I wonder if Tom just went to Shiv, you know, at the end of this episode or, you know, in the very near future and was like, Hey, let's, let's, what about Kendall? Like, what do you think about flipping to him and, and seeing, you know, like rolling our dice with him? I, I'd be very curious to see. I think she, she might go for that, honestly, because she is so pissed off at her dad and at Roman and, and there's no real clear path forward for her in the company and Tom, and she could potentially be saving Tom, which maybe she doesn't really care that much about Tom, but maybe there is some sort of guilt potentially building up there. Uh, I think that would just be very interesting. And the way Kendall lays it out is, is enticing. Uh, and then of course he does that dirty trick where he takes the picture of Tom at the end. Uh, so you can kind of hang that over his head if he needs to. Uh, and show that Tom is sneaking around and meeting with Kendall. So uh, I don't know. I, I'm very curious and nervous for these characters. <laughs> uh, Tom, again, is just seeming more and more depressed and more and more um, desperate. So I'm, yeah, I'm kind of scared. And it's crazy because it, Game of Succession, none of these characters are good people. None of these characters are really likable, like at their core, but you still manage to empathize with them and sympathize with them in these really shitty situations definitely i mean we saw how shiv was willing to i mean well i guess shiv was all always left leaning or at least that's the field she worked in when she was a political consultant but Mm. obviously atn is conservative and and that's what logan's always been kind of campaigning for but shiv was trying to get them to jump ship and back a democratic candidate when they were determining who to who to uh, support in the election. But, you know, if she's willing to have the whole corporation jump ship like that, I could definitely see her jump ship to, to Kindle with Tom, like you were saying. So, but that would also require her exactly. to kind of put Tom's, I guess, well, I guess it would be mutually beneficial for shit for Shiv, but it would require her to prioritize Tom's uh, needs ahead of her own, probably, which has not been a very successful uh doesn't have a good track record no not at all any final thoughts on episode six before we move into news it was a very different episode i, I don't know it's hard it to was it, to it was i agree uh i i liked how political it was and how they were really it, like it's i don't want to say it's meta but like it's yeah, it's pretty self-aware like what it's kind of poking at and what you know 
the climate is like uh there's that stupid funny um uh, this line that logan says where he says he's a climate denier because he just doesn't he it, it doesn't matter what the climate is like politically or socially he just kind of just does what he wants and it doesn't really affect him too much and that's gonna be you know we'll see i mean they, they went roman was able to convince logan to go with this crazy like potentially dangerous um you know i mean political candidate and presidential candidate ultimately and right. that is going to be I, i'm very i'm curious to see where that is going to go and how much that is going to be a factor going forward in this show because the political stuff had been largely removed from the last half you know the first half of the season or so um there's been no you know shiv had exited her role with gill and so that stuff had kind of faded and then she was much more involved in the company and now the political spectrum is now opening back up in in the show so i'm i'm curious to see i mean is this is this show ultimately if there's only one or two more seasons left is it going to come down to the presidential election is that going to be a huge factor in what ends up happening with this company and with this family that would be it'd be interesting i'm not sure how i necessarily feel about it but it, it, there's a lot of possibilities there we'll just have to wait and see we've got four episodes left this season so that should have us wrapping up right before the new year i would imagine uh if, and as long as they don't skip a week but a lot to uncover before we hit season four moving into news we have some mcu news to kick things off and this is a i would say an exciting piece of news as far as mcu news goes i know we're kind of back and forth just like we were talking about hawkeye but this is undeniably good news i would say delroy lindo has joined the cast of blade we obviously just got the tease for it at the end of eternals hearing mahershala ali's voice we don't know what the movie's going to be about we don't know who delroy lindo is playing but in my opinion adding an actor of this caliber cannot be a bad thing whatsoever i mean you've got mahershala already putting him with delroy i mean those two alone are going to get me to go to the theater this blade is going to be way down the line in the mcu so we'll have at least another like three four probably five movies between now and then or definitely like 10 if you're including shows so the fatigue that we've kind of talked about now could be like extreme fatigue by that point but even then even if that were to be the case delroy and mahershala would get me to go see this i i don't know if you feel the same way but thoughts on delroy joining the mcu uh it's i mean there's no other details really than him in this movie with Marshall, but uh, it's certainly not bad news. I mean, you can't really be mad at Delroy Lindo hopping into one of these comic book movies. He's a, an incredible actor and him and Marshall Ali. I mean, like that's going to be a, a powerhouse duo. We'll, we'll have to wait and see if they're going to be a, um, you know, a team or partners or, you know, on the good side, or if, if there's going to be a, if there's going to be conflict there, if he might be playing a villain or some other antagonistic, character i'm they i'm definitely peaked you know like, it makes me more excited it makes me a little bit more interested to see where they're taking this one but it's still a ways off i mean they're not even gonna be filming this for maybe seven eight more months so right i believe it's supposed to be like in like filming next summer summer 2022 so there's a ways to go between now and then but you know after especially after seeing last summer with defy bloods like the him and kang the conqueror on the uh the mm -hmm. landmine scene just uh absolutely fantastic i know jake is a diehard fan for that scene um the whole movie is fantastic but that that scene particularly between them is wonderful so i'm excited i know we just got uh the blurb on twitter today that keanu reeves has said it would be an honor to join the mcu and that he would be uh that there's so many visionaries and big stuff happening that he, he would be excited to be a part of it so i Maybe we'll have some news eventually after that quote pops out that uh, he's going to be joining in some capacity, but now it's all just speculation. But moving from Blade to Blade Runner, Johnny, a live action Blade Runner series is in development. You know, we've got Alien already, the, the Hulu series that's been, uh, that's been, I guess that's, that's coming soon or sooner than this, obviously, but there had never been mention of a live action Blade Runner series as the resident Blade Runner fan. Good news, bad news, indifferent. 
Um, I mean, it's tough to say. We don't really know a lot. Uh, I think that on its face, it's, it's very exciting because I think a Blade Runner story, I think, can lend itself very well to kind of a somewhat long form uh, presentation. I think, especially if it's another kind of detective noir story, I think that kind of extension with, uh, you know, a, a mystery playing out as we have seen on HBO before, whether it's True Detective or Mayor of Easttown. I mean, just imagine something like that, but in the world of Blade Runner, I think people would be very excited and interested in that. But it's hard to say because we don't know who is writing the show. We don't know who the showrunner is. We don't know who's going to end up directing any of these episodes. Presumably, this is going to be set up at HBO or HBO Max, but we don't even know that really at this point. It's just well, the Alien is in... show is on is on Hulu, right? Yeah, well, they have Fox, uh, which is now Disney, which is now Hulu, that they had the Alien okay. right. So that makes sense. Blade Runner, HBO uh, or Warner helped produce that. Uh, Adult Swim is doing the HBO or the HBO. Adult Swim is doing the Blade Runner anime series that is coming out uh, this month, I believe. Uh, so they they have the uh, kind of keys to the kingdom when it comes to Blade Runner. But I, uh, you know, who, who knows? I mean, and I want to be optimistic. I want to be excited, but there's not really enough to go on. I am interested. I'm curious, but they don't have my, you know, attention necessarily at this point. It's just a, a little something to keep an eye on. A little on. intrigue. Yeah, if it ends up, you know, if they end up adding some really cool, interesting names to it, then it'll be time to get excited. But now it's just a glimmer of an idea uh, that could happen and could be good or it could be just bad or mid or something. And I, you know, if, if it, if they, worst case scenario, they do this show and it's just not very good. The production values aren't good or the, the writing is bad. It's not interesting it won't really bother me that much it's just a show like and it might just be a one-off kind of limited series maybe just 10 episodes the movies still exist the movies tell a great story i think my one hope with this is that it tells a story that is completely detached from the other from the movies that way that's what i was going to ask you would you want it to be like the ryan gosling timeline the harrison ford timeline like in continuing with any storylines or do you just want it to be something completely new with a different Blade Runner and just set in the same world? Yeah, I, I think just set it in the same world and, and just do something completely separate because then you don't have to, no one's wires are going to get crossed. You don't have to worry about affecting. Like, I, I just think you're playing with fire a little too much if you try to do that. And makes sense. You know, also, it's like, it, it gets, it comes down to the, you know, nostalgia baiting aspect of it. Like Blade Runner, I think, is an interesting enough world where you can just tell a full-on original story with original characters and not have to rely on names that we know and, and specific places that we know. I think we could do something a little bit different and, and interesting. Um, presumably, this would be quite an expensive show. Um, and I, I would love, I mean, I just love this world so much. I, I hope that they do it justice. I hope they have some amazing sets and effects and everything. And it just looks dynamite and it just because Blade Runner more than anything else is the setting it is the atmosphere of the world and that is the key that's the key ingredient if you can recreate that I think everything else will follow and I think people will be satisfied right well going from one uh you know Blade Runner 2049 from one Denny Villeneuve project to another we don't usually include this in the news segment you know uh, blu-ray 4k announcements but Knowing our audience, we have to put this out there. Warner Brothers announced today that Dune will be hitting for it'll release on digital on December 3rd. So if you haven't seen it yet, it's not on HBO Max anymore. You can rent or purchase it there on starting December 3rd. But January 11th is the day to add it to your physical media collection, your Blu-ray, your 4K, your Steelbook, what have you. Johnny, how many copies are you planning on purchasing here? <laughs> Uh, hey, I'm just going to get my 4k steelbook from Best Buy and I'll be, I'll be, I will say that steelbook is fantastic. The The design it's is so far, far and away better than the, you know, generic floating head cover poster for, uh, for just like the generic 4k release, but the steelbook with the, the sand dune poster yeah, is that, beautiful. Yeah. That poster has been goaded ever since it came out. That was the I think it was the real D 3d poster that they were kind of promoting. Uh, and it's been my lock screen on my phone for like two months now, probably. Um, but 
I really love that poster and I'm just, I'm so pleased to see that they took it. And not only is, I mean, it's the cover obviously, but then on the back they've added, there's like Fremen walking up like a dune and then there's a high a guild highliner in the sky and some of the Harkonnen ships. So they really, they added some details there too, which I think is really cool. And then the discs look pretty sweet and the interior looks pretty sweet as well. There's like a silhouette of, of Paul and then the, uh, it's like a rackus with spice kind of like drifting off into space. It's very, very, uh, very well done. Very cool. So I'm looking forward to as soon as that, that pre-order goes up, I'm, I'm clocking that in. <laughs> well, we have gotten confirmation that uh, we'll get the review copy for, from Warner Brothers Home Entertainment and a giveaway copy as well. So there will be some spice in the future of one lucky follower. So <laughs> people will have to, it'll, they won't be shipping it out till the new year. So just to wet your appetite, you know, wet, wet the palate. Stay tuned for a Dune giveaway. We're not done yet with Arrakis. Well, that's the end of news. Let's transition now into our King Richard review. I wrote me a 78-page plan for their whole career before they was even born. Yeah, baby, yeah! <laughs> These girls so great, how come I've never heard of them? They're from Compton. It's okay. They're just not used to seeing good-looking peoples like us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's nervous. Make a step up. Maybe she ought to take a few more steps up. Just get someplace safe. I think you might just have the next Michael Jordan. Oh, no, brother man. I got me the next, too. What's the next step? You got to take. You're not going to just be representing you. You're going to be representing every little black girl on Earth. They're not going to let you doubt. How could you? This world ain't never had no respect for Richard Williams, but they're going to respect y'all. This is, of course, the Richard Williams biopic, the father of Venus and Serena Williams, the tennis legends. It is now playing in theaters, released last week, and it's on HBO Max as well to stream as, at, to stream at home. Will Smith leading the way as Richard Williams. We've got Anjane Ellis as well, John Bernthal, Sania Sidney, and Demi Singleton rounding out the cast it's currently at a 92 percent critic score 99 percent audience score absolutely crushing it on both sides myself i gave this an 83 out of 100 i enjoyed it a lot like i said it was the opening film at film fest 919 back in october got to check it out there co won the uh the audience favorite i believe it tied with come on come on um which johnny wrote up a review for on the site last week if you want to check that out just to you know, plug that while we're talking about it. But it's a lot of fun. It's a good family, heartwarming. Like it's, a, it's not a Thanksgiving movie in the sense that it's like about Thanksgiving, but it's definitely a Thanksgiving, like fan, go see it with your family on the big screen, watch it, like have a good time. It's a good story. And of course the, the talk of the movie is the Will Smith performance, the, the best actor campaign that we've got going on there. Johnny, thoughts on the movie general thoughts before we start breaking it down yeah i was really really happy with this as i mentioned i'm not a huge sports movie guy but this is interesting enough with the performances and with the writing kind of what it explores throughout that it it took some different angles and, and just offered a little bit different perspective than what you usually see can't really name any movies where it's about you know super famous athlete or athletes in this case but the focus is on someone else. It's, it's really, it's not about them necessarily. It's kind of how they were molded into what they ended up becoming. Which and, is not a reason to be upset. This is not uh, the, the Twitter reactionary people are, you know, freaking out. Like, I can't believe we saw that one tweet that I think it was shared in our group. Like, I can't believe that the movie is about the two best female athletes in the world. And they focused it on the man. And it's like, Venus and Serena co-produced this movie. This is their movie that they wanted to name it about their father. They wanted it to be about their father. So get some information before you freak out just about this, this reactionary content. So calm down. But I agree with you. Like, like you said, no, it's rare to kind of put the star in the background and instead focus on this. Were you familiar with the, just the, the story in general of Richard Williams and like, I know we, we've obviously grown up in like the Venus and Serena era where even if you aren't a tennis fan, you like know of their greatness and of their legacy and how long that they've been fantastic. But like for myself beyond just like 
having watched them play like you know they start what was it 1994 when the her first match was played when venus's first pro match so it's mm-hmm. like that was before we were born but <laughs> we weren't watching like we weren't alive to watch or witness like their early years and like even if we were alive we weren't watching tennis as like toddlers so <laughs> kind of we we got them like in their peak in their prime and they they still are but you know I didn't know about I was familiar with the story but not like to know the details or like this all felt new to me you know learning I knew about the like kind of overbearing pushy father but nothing like the details of what we actually got to see in that movie so that was a very nice balance of like knowing what to expect but not knowing any of the details so it all still felt surprising does that make sense yeah I think that's fair I mean so you're kind of what you were alluding to or saying I have I said earlier in the show I think that I grew up pretty big into sports watching you know whether it was football basketball soccer playing it whatever I, tennis was not one of those that I really paid a lot of attention to or got into or watched or played myself uh so it, it kind of says something that you know I'm not that well uh you know informed on the sport but of course everyone knew you know knew of Serena and Venus growing up in my generation and are still very aware of them and are aware of their success and their legacy and that that is continuing to be built and I thought that I and I because we are as young as we are maybe people of that era that were paying attention that were conscious human beings in the world watching these kids make these these debuts back in the 90s those people were probably more aware of their father and the influence that he had and the presence he had in their you know as a kind of a coach and as a almost like a manager and and other things I really didn't know that much about it I mean I I was vaguely aware um because at the point where I kind of was growing up and, and was paying attention to them and hearing about them. I mean, they're full grown women and adults. And so they, right. they didn't have their father necessarily as part of the spotlight as much as when they were minors and children and they needed someone there, you know, with their, their dad and their mom. Uh, so I thought this was a story that deserved to be told for one, because it's pretty like unbelievable <laughs> that this, you know, man uh essentially designed these girls to become these tennis legends and it happened like almost to perfection if not better um because you know serena uh in particular is the greatest tennis player of all time one of the greatest athletes of all of all time if not the best so um it's uh it's just really remarkable and will smith he embodies this man so well and seems like he really does him justice with his, you know, he's, it's a tough line to walk because he is a complicated figure in some ways. I think overall, of course, he's well-respected and well-regarded as a coach and as a father and everything, but you know, how questionable were his methods? How questionable was this? And I think uh, for the most part, the movie just kind of, you know, and, and as you said, Serena and, and Venus pr- helped produce this movie. So I'd be curious, you know, they probably don't want to. They didn't want to like paint their father in a, a super negative, negative light yeah. or anything. Like, like, is, the, you know, like he obviously had like moral issues of like, like it was, they, they touched on it that like, at, especially at the end with the tag, like he was unfaithful to his wife and like they ended up splitting later yeah. on, but like, it's not like that was like a heavy, they kind of like mentioned it. And then like, they had that one altercation in the kitchen basically. And then that was it, yeah. you know, it was, wasn't like, uh, uh, all right. Cause again, they, they're not going to want to like, yeah. Put, put air, all of that dirty laundry, like on a major blockbuster movie like <laughs> this. But um, I wanted to go back really quick, just about like, again, the awareness and kind of the, them being like on the periphery of our like sports knowledge, but the um I didn't go into this expecting this is probably like ignorance on my part but like I obviously like you said Serena is the greatest tennis player of all time and like we know like that Serena is better than Venus so when I went into this and it was the Venus Williams movie like I didn't realize that 
she right. had gone pro before and that she was better until Serena surpassed her later on. So like I kept waiting and I was like, when are they going to shift focus from Venus and, and put it back on Serena? Um, but then we didn't get to see that until that great moment at the end. Like, yeah, she's she's pro now, but you're going to be the best that there ever was. Um, when when uh, Richard gets to have that moment with her looking onto the court. But let me before we get any further along, let me give a little plot rundown here. So in case anyone who is listening along this far and has no idea what this movie is about, armed with a clear vision and a brazen 78 page plan, Richard Williams is determined to write his daughters, Venus and Serena, into history. Training on Compton, California's neglected tennis courts, rain or shine, the girls are shaped by their father's unyielding commitment and their mother's balanced perspective and keen intuition, defying the seemingly insurmountable odds and prevailing expectations laid before them. Based on the true story that will inspire the world, King Richard follows the uplifting journey of a family whose unwavering resolve and unconditional belief ultimately delivers two of the world's greatest sports legends. So a pretty, like I said, heartwarming, uplifting story there. There's a lot that goes into it to kind of beyond the the Will Smith performance. But first and foremost, it is Will Smith's starring vessel as this father. He fully embodies the character. He I, I like I it's there's no like transformational look like you can tell it is Will Smith but it's the same way that we talked well I guess we didn't talk about it but in my review I talked about on the on the site for Spencer like Kristen Stewart like obviously she looked it gets transformed to like look like Diana but she gets lost in the performance he gets lost in the performance in the same way here it's just like you can still look at him and pick it out that it's Will Smith but I I, I went into this movie I saw it earlier than you in October and but the Will Smith hype train had already left the station. Like it was already like a done deal. People were praising him and just showering him in all sorts of compliments. And so I wasn't like cynical going in by any means, but it was kind of like, okay, let's see what all the hype is about. Let's see if it's real. And that like 100% justified it. He delivered, absolutely delivered it and lived up to the hype. I was that the same reaction that you had or same, same experience watching this. Yeah, I mean, I uh, I I knew that this would be a big role. I mean, this is a role that had been talked about for Will Smith since, I mean, basically like a year, if not more, because as soon as he was cast in it, they were like, okay, this is going to be, this is going to be big. He's going for the Oscar, etc. And rightfully so. And I and I also have to pat myself on the back somewhat. I mean, because let's face it, Will Smith was talked about a lot coming this season, but there was also a lot of attention paid to people like Bandit Cumberbatch, Denzel Washington. Uh, of course, you have other big, big names like Leo, Adam Driver, Joaquin Phoenix. Uh, so those were in the mix. But my, hey, my pre-festival Oscar predictions, I said, Will Smith, he's winning this. And lo and behold. And that was back in September. So yeah. So lo and behold, he is still, if not, you know, he's more, he's far more, I think, I think, of all the acting categories, this is the one where people are like, yeah, this is not, this is not changing. He is going to win. Uh, nothing is going to come out this year. No one else well, is going to gain the momentum that they would need to surpass him. Well, two things about that. Well, first off, his campaign is in full swing. Like, obviously, the movie has just come out and it's, it had gotten all the praise prior, but he's got the show coming out, the National Geographic show coming out on Disney Plus December 8th. So that's Mm. six episodes where he's going to be front and center during prime like consideration time. And then his book came out a couple of weeks ago, his, his uh, memoir called will. So there's no lack of Will Smith content. Like it it is not a coincidence that that book came out right before this Oscar campaign really revved up, you know, like, Oh yeah. These, these things don't just happen. It's, it's all like calculated to put him front of mind and make sure that he is, on voters ballots like come come voting day but with all that being said the hype was there so long ago is it sometimes uh, maybe not as much with actor but like you know it seems like every season there's a best picture front runner that starts out in September or like with the early festivals and then by the time it's December it's lost steam and you know a new uh, like a someone late to the game comes and and ends up winning at the Oscars is that going to be the case with best actor can 
Will Smith make it the whole way, do you think? Or is Denzel going to come in with Tragedy of Macbeth and, and take over? Or, or is, it, is it a lock? No, I think this is really, this one is really a lock. Uh, I think this is kind of a lock in the same way Joaquin kind of always felt like a lock a couple of years ago. I mean, Adam Driver, I know a lot of people were rallying behind him for Marriage Story, but it was, it always felt like, okay, Joaquin's going to win. Like he's, he has been around for a long time. It, people were kind of amazed that he had yet to win. And this was a big showy role in a big, you know, popular movie. I think this is a similar trajectory to that, but Will Smith has all the stuff that you already mentioned, his memoir. Uh, he's, you know, on all these magazines, he's hosting different things, uh, shows and whatnot. So he has that momentum and I don't see that. That's something that will definitely carry him through into, you know, January and, and whatnot. Denzel, he was really the other, the big other name I thought, at, you know, coming into the season because people just love him so much. Uh, and, you know, Tragedy of Macbeth, I mean, people have seen that movie. You know, a lot of people have seen that movie. There have been a lot of reviews. I just don't really see, I think we would be talking about that in him a lot more if he was actually going to pose a genuine threat to Will Smith. It's all, I think, still very much Will Smith centric. Uh, the as far as the best actor discussion goes even with leo you know the don't look up reactions just dropped last week and people were really high on leo they're like he is really great he's amazing he's probably gonna get nominated again and i'm sure he will i think that's i, I had hey my my best actor predictions for back in september i had leo in there i had leo i had denzel i had bandit Cumberbatch, and i have will smith winning and I, I think at least four of those are still going to be accurate. Bradley Cooper and Nightmare Alley. We'll see what happens with that. But um, I, yeah, no, I think this is, this is going to happen. And I think it'll also, it'll be in there for best picture. I think a lot of people like this movie. I think a lot of people feel good coming out of this movie and they feel good while they're watching it. And it's an inspirational story. It's entertaining. Uh, and I, I'm really curious to see how it does. I mean, we could see it, uh, you know, it wouldn't be my best picture choice by any stretch of the imagination. I'm sure a lot of people could probably guess what my choice would be, but it's, it's still a very, it's a well-made film. It is an impressively, you know, kind of put together, uh, you know, biopic sports drama. And I think that in, in a time I mean, I where... could see it, I could see it winning because like, like I said, it, it won the audience favorite at film fest. And I don't, it's very safe. You know, it's like, exactly. I wouldn't be upset with it winning. I mean, sure. There are movies that are better, yeah. but like, it's good. It's, it makes you feel good. It has a great charismatic lead performance from one of our big movie stars. Like mm -hmm. it's, it, it checks all the boxes that like a traditional, like, it's not like a revolutionary pick, like a parasite or anything like that, but like, it is like your typical, like best picture Oscar winner, I would say. Yes. I think that's, that's fair to say. I, I, I do think that it, it, it has that potential for sure. Well, Going back to, we, we talked about all the Will Smith hype, but not necessarily about the performance. Like this character is someone who's, you know, even for us without the knowledge, I said, I knew that it was going to be like an overbearing dad, someone pushing their children. But I kind of went into this expecting like the modern comparison of like a LeVar Ball type, like my kids are the greatest in the world, like pushing, pushing the kids to just like be superstars and put them in the, in the spotlight. But that was not the case. This character was super grounded. Will Smith did a great job of like having two modes. Like we see him when he's talking, like he, he's like a sweet, loving, compassionate dad, but he also like is a strict coach and will like be hard on them and make sure they do their homework and are polite and all, all of the different steps in his 78 page plan. But then there's also the like, he's this smooth talking businessman almost, but then he's also in the kitchen with his wife showing off of his, like all of his insecurities. And that when she calls him out for him thinking that he's not smart enough and just like that, he's this, he kind of switches between these two modes of just being like magnetic and also being like the most insecure, like shyest person in the room, yeah. you know? No, I think that there's a very good balance. And I think that's the thing is, I, I probably would not have liked Will Smith in this as much if he was just like a hard ass the entire time. Like just, right. you know, I don't, that's very, that's one dimensional. I think that this would not be as interesting, but I think there is a good enough balance, a little bit 
more nuanced than I was expecting with regards to how he is as a dad, how he is as a coach, how he is as a, a husband and how he deals with other people, you know, how the level of respect and or disrespect and that that's all mixed in. And it does make for a complicated guy. Like I don't, I didn't finish the movie and think, wow, that was a, you know, what a hero or like, what a, what a, it's an amazing story. And he is an incredible uh, mind and, and his drive and all these other things that I like, I don't know if I would like him if I knew him, like if I, if I knew him in real life and, and had to uh, exist with him. Like I, I certainly empathized with his wife's position in that big kitchen scene that you were talking about where mm-hmm. she is just so fed up and she is just so angry and, and tired. And I absolutely felt that. And I, that, that's what was so great about that scene and the, the, this pair of actors working together on Janu Allison and Will Smith I, I totally believed in both of them and I believed in their relationship, the good and the bad. Like that was, that's what was impressive. Again, maybe I expected this movie to just be a little bit more one dimensional or a little bit more paint by the numbers. In some ways it is paint by the numbers, but I think it's done just well enough and it doesn't paper over things too cleanly to, to dull it down for me. I think that's what made, I think that's what put it over the top from, from pretty good to like more like great in my opinion. Well, that's what I wanted to get into next, the outside of Will Smith. We've talked all about him and his performance, but outside of this, I know you said that you aren't like crazy about sports movies. I mean, I'm not, for someone who like you is, has lived and grown up all around sports. I mean, I watch them, but it's not like when I pick my favorite movies, it's not like remember the Titans Friday night lights and coach Carter or something like, like Mm. I, I, I have seen them, but it's not the, the, elite in my book but I feel like this kind of has this feeling of something that could have come out in like the early 2000s mid 2000s the level of like wholesomeness like I keep going back to like the feel good like family friendly heartwarming story but outside of like the fantastic Will Smith performance I feel like it's it's very good still but it's just kind of like a traditional straightforward sort of sports drama you know you've got like your your athlete who's facing the obstacles and they're putting in the work and you've got the training montages and they're overcoming all of these obstacles. And then they, they have a setback and then they like keep training and then they get the, the big game at the end. But I mean, obviously it's based on a true story. So it's not like they can like, I mean, they can embellish a little bit, but the end results they can't. So I guess the subversion is that it's, you know, they get to the big game and they don't win. They don't overcome and, and have the the big victory to celebrate with at the end but you know that that is like a great it is a great ending because even though uh she ends up losing the match she comes out to the the applause and fans of everyone who is just proud of her for doing what she did um but i mean i don't know if you did you you've kind of hinted the opposite that it was it did subvert enough stuff to kind of make it stand out from your traditional sports drama um so I guess, do you have a rebuttal to that? Yeah, I, I, you know, for someone not familiar with the story necessarily, I had no idea. Like when it got to the final act, like the last 30 minutes, I, I was like, what? There's 30 minutes left of this movie? Like, how the hell is this going to end? It didn't really feel like it was necessarily building to some big event or like some big match. Like it, it does in a way. And it does that in a way I wasn't expecting though. Like it was, and even the result of that match isn't, I wasn't aware of it. I'm sure it was a huge deal when it happened that I was not alive to witness it. Uh, but so I didn't know, I didn't know what the end result was going to be. And I was, you know, I was a little bit on the edge. I was like, what the hell is it? What's actually going to happen? And it's, it is subversive. I think, cause you're expecting one thing to happen and it doesn't, at least if you're not familiar with the story. So I liked that and I liked that it kept me kind of interested in guessing and maybe my experience would be different if I was more familiar with her career and and the beginning and how it started but uh, I liked that and I thought that and even within the confines of that though you could do any I mean you could really do anything with this script it's really the way they chose to structure it and how to direct it and let it all play out where it it culminates in that match and it culminates in the aftermath and the emotional reaction 
of the family uh, to the match and what that means for you know Venus uh, in particular going forward. So that was that was uh, something I I quite liked about it, and I thought that the fact that I wasn't mad or bothered or just like disappointed maybe in how it ended up resolving i think that is kind of a testament to how well you know kind of structured and, and pieced together right. the actual story. yeah i mean i i don't have any complaints about like i i liked the ending as well i don't know it just kind of like i feel like it it did it very well i i think i put this in my tweet review was that like the when the subject matter is so good, the performances are so good, like the natural story, you don't have to like necessarily um, like do the most when you're making the movie um, that it kind of just like is able to speak for itself. So like the fact that it played the hits uh, as far as like the traditional sports drama script, like that was fine. It was like, it didn't need to do anything special. It reminds me talking about it now. It's reminding me of like my, commentary on just mercy like that was a movie that i really really liked um it didn't do anything fancy or special as far as like the way it told the story but the the story itself and the performances that that helped tell the story were just so good on their own that it didn't need to do anything more and it was still like a fantastic movie so that that's kind of what i was getting at but you mentioned being surprised there were still 30 minutes left this movie's two hours and 26 minutes i again big fan really liked it it's a movie about tennis so it may sound silly to complain that there is too much tennis but I felt like that was the case you know it's the scenes are done well you know when they are it's like the good cutting good action but you know if they trimmed a training montage here or you know shortened down the the part where they're at um John Bernthal they're like with John Bernthal and they're learning at his academy and stuff like they could have trimmed a little bit of that um Mm. and i think it still would have been as effective because like when they do it it's done well but it's just done a lot um so that like by the time you're seeing it for the third or fourth time it's just kind of like okay here we go another scene um but i did like the the length of like the whole final the finale the the big match the icing from the the opponent and just like the ultimate finale. So that's a, a sort of nitpicky thing. I mean, it, it didn't feel like exorbitantly long, even though it was two and a half hours. Um, but if I had to do something to kind of make it make, it's a four out of five for me, but if it had been a little bit tighter, I would say that that's probably four and a half to five star territory. Oh man. I, I didn't really mind the length. I thought it kind of snuck up on me. Like I didn't realize how long it was, but I didn't mind. Like I, I thought that I, it never felt too long. Uh, again, maybe maybe I would feel differently on a rewatch now, knowing and how the story goes and everything. But uh, for the first time around, at least, it didn't didn't bother me or, or take anything off of it necessarily. Well, I'm happy for you. That's fantastic. Again, just a <laughs> just a nitpick for me. So it's not any it's not a make or break part of the movie. But wow, I, you are just a bastard. I know I'm a savage critic over here, but. <laughs> Like I said, this is four out of five for me and 83 out of 100. I don't think you gave it a score, Johnny, but any final thoughts on King Richard as you give this your rating? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a solid. I gave it a four out of five on Letterboxd. Say it's like a solid, you know, 78, 79 out of 100 probably. It's just a really good acting showcase and an intriguing story, an interesting story uh, with a, a perspective that you're not really, uh, you know, that isn't that common in, in these sorts of movies and these, this sort of sports subgenre. So I was a fan, certainly recommend it, certainly, you know, recommend supporting it, checking it out, whether it's in theaters or on, on HBO max, watch it with your family, watch it with your friends, whatever. It's uh, I think it's, it's one of those feel good movies. It's a crowd pleasing movie and uh, it's nice to get a, a, a well-made crowd pleasing movie. Sometimes they, they aim to crowd please and maybe they still do for the, mo- for the most part, but I, it's like, they don't, put in the craft and the time to like really make it something I think that actually stands up. And I think this one does pretty well. So I am with you there. There you have it. King Richard. It's got the stamp of approval from both of us, the inside the film room approval. And thank you all for listening to another episode. We really appreciate it. And we appreciate the support and we would appreciate it. If you took your support to your inbox by subscribing to 
the Rewind, our newsletter. You can find it on our website, on our social media, in the link in our bio. So go ahead and do that. We'll send every inside the film room, not every individually, but once a week, we will be collaborating. We will be bringing everything together and delivering it directly to you. So you won't miss out on any of our reviews, any of our podcasts, videos, giveaways, all of that good stuff will be sent straight to your inbox. Absolutely. Thank you all for your support. Thank you for listening. Follow us on Twitter. Keep up with those giveaways. Keep up with everything that we have going on and coming up. Also check us out on Instagram, us on Facebook, subscribe on YouTube. Stay tuned and you can find those accounts at Inside Film Room. And while you're at it, be sure to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts. We're on Apple, Stitcher, Spotify, Google, Amazon, iHeartRadio, anywhere you listen, we are there. And don't come back next week. We will be off for the holiday. Happy Thanksgiving to everyone. And we will see you in two weeks.